get the let's get the evening started. Um, again, my name is Sierra Van Richtergroot. I am the Education Programs Manager at Poster House, and it is my absolute and distinct pleasure to introduce you all to Cheryl D. Miller. Uh, Cheryl holds a Master of Science in Communications degree from Pratt Institute and a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Maryland Institute College of Art Foundation Studies, the Rhode Island School of Design. She is a former business owner of Cheryl D. Miller Design, which was a New York service corporate communications that served Fortune 500 clientele. Based out of New York City in the 1980s and 90s, Cheryl's amazing agency service clients such as Time Warner, the Ford Foundation, Philip Morris, and McDonald's, you know, those very low key names. Um, and we are incredibly excited to have this design industry winner of so many awards, <laughs> Association of Graphic Design, we have Art Directors Club of New Jersey, Broadcast Design, we're really incredibly excited to have her join us today to discuss her print magazine article, Black Designers Missing in Action from 1987. She will also then be reading portions of that and her follow-up article, Still Missing from 2016, as well as discussing her Pratt Institute thesis, Transcending the Problems of the Black Designer to, to Success in the Marketplace. And somewhere in all of this amazing information she will be sharing out, we will also have time for Q&A. So, Again, please feel free to put any questions that you have for Cheryl in the Q&A portion, and then also please feel free to add anything to the chat. Uh, Cheryl, you said you had some housekeeping yourself. <laughs> oh, no, we'll do the housekeeping when, you know. You want to do it later? Okay. No. So, Cheryl, take us, take us all the way to the beginning. You started writing, well, not all the way, I guess I got to pick it back. <laughs> take us... Take us to where you were when you started writing this uh, print magazine article, the first article. Okay, long story short, and I want to shout out to everybody that was with me on my bomb Zoom or Zoom bomb, okay? <laughs> um, thank you very much. I hope that you're tuning in again. I want to thank, um, um, thank Sierra and the Powder House for hosting this, and we're going to get through this because I think it's really important. Um, and the reason that I wanted to do, um, I was telling Sierra that the reason that I wanted to do um, the Zoom in particular was not on the topic, mm -hmm. <laughs> not on the topic. I can talk about the topic. You guys can better talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and design. You can better talk about it than I can, okay? That's not the topic, okay? The topic is um, Black Designers Missing in Action and the article. And the reason that, um, this article, I want to talk about how, how um, the article was written and not so much why, and it's probably important to understand when, but I think it's important that I tell and pass along to the next generation um, how I wrote this article. And this article is the article that just keeps giving. We're here because this article was published and so many incredible things have happened to me because I published this article, it was published, <laughs> okay? And the story of it, I think, is what's important because um, I want the next legacy generation designer to be involved in trade publishing. And I learned some things that this article, I'm, I'm meeting you because of this article. Um, many of um, the article is second and third generation noted in works of scholarship. This article, um, I would even dare say, is because the practicing field has widened because of the article. Um, and it's not about me. It's about, I documented a piece of history at a particular time. And I really want to go through what I call the tenets of some of my theories about doing design. That's another topic. This is about doing the article. Um, and um, I'm going to do a little reading about it, but I want you guys to take notes because it's, again, we, we could spin off and I've asked Ciara to make sure to keep me on point. I don't want I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to talk about why. You guys know more why than I do, <laughs> okay? And I'll put, I'll put my quote, simply put, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But I want to talk about how this article came to be. This article has affected your lives, my lives, my life, and most importantly, the greatest honor that this article has done for me personally is I have a collection, the Cheryl Miller Collection at Stanford University. 50 years of my life, 50 boxes, 50 years of my life, 
I have a I have an open collection. I'm an archivist to it. Um, at Stanford University in Palo Alto, um, we met because Michael Grant was looking for this article, <laughs> and he was looking for the thesis, and he was looking for um, to read it to his scholar group, and took it to Regina Roberts, who was um, one of the special collections librarians at Stanford, and she unearthed Pratt, and Pratt gave her a one-time usage, and then the scholarly the scholar group wanted. 20 copies to read. And I'm like, this one article. So she had to get a copyright. All right. And you can Google, you can Google and see the video of her telling this. Just Google Cheryl D. Miller Stanford and the press release and the video about how, you know, they acquired my collection. I don't have any affiliation to Stanford. Okay. Meaning now I do my whole life is there, but I didn't graduate from there. I didn't donate a library or anything like that. Um, they came looking for copyright permission to copy the thesis for um, 20 scholar readings, okay? Scholarly readings, scholars wanted to read this. And when Regina found me to get the permission, um, you know, she found Pratt and she found me and then she says, Ms. Miller, what else you have? <laughs> and I said, funny, you should ask. And I had saved, you know, in order to have a collection, you have to save everything. And I knew that I was doing important work. And um, and so I saved everything. I saved everything from the time I was a kid and I put it in a box, I labeled it. She said, Ms. Miller, this is one of the best collections I've ever picked up. She says, the only thing you didn't do was put it in acid boxes and archival folders. And so we took out, you can go to my web, one of my websites and a friend came over who was like a life events photographer. And she took pictures of Regina going through every piece of work I've done since I was in, since I was in high school. Okay, and that included all of the writings, all of the, you know, back, all of the, please wind me back. And it's very, very important to understand, um, I'm a history note, okay, I'm a very important history note. And my peers that worked with us, you know, um, we are history notes that didn't, you know, not many Wikipedias, we're not, we didn't cross over and um, digitize, but we were nonetheless there. And I think that's a place where future, um, you know, um, thesis projects and things to document, um, um, I would say the baby boomers, uh, we, you know, the birth of Google is 2002. Many of us stopped practicing, got frustrated, changed gears. We did, you know, I stopped to have a family, okay, and didn't return back. Um, and so we're, we're kind of lost in this space, like, oh my God, I didn't know you were there. Oh my God, I didn't know, but this article, <laughs> this article was there and it's in the card catalog, all right, which is what's phenomenal. This article's in the, card catalog and um, uh, year after year since its publication, people find me. I don't have a Wikipedia page, so it's not like you can just unearth me, find my phone number, okay? I've got a couple of websites, you can back in me, you know, write me. And I wanted to have this Zoom because within the last month, two guys, you know, two of you guys found me and wanted to ask me questions about the article. And I said, let's take this opportunity while we're all quarantined and I hope everybody is safe and doing the protocols and doing everything that you're supposed to be doing. Um, I'm praying for you, you pray for me, okay? Um, to try to talk about this article in a way that I haven't, I've had the blessed opportunity of talking one-on-one -on -one since 1987. I have talked about this article and it has led to all of this wonderful work in your life, in my life, the collection in Stanford. I'm here today because of the article. All right, so let's get busy with that. And what had happened, to make a long story short, and there are other interviews. I have a YouTube channel. Guys are, are very, very... Um, uh, I'm meeting so many different people that want to interview me and I try to make everything a little different, but it's, it's difficult to take a le legacy career and put it all in one, you know, in one interview. So I talk, I try to talk about different things, but if you want to hear more of my backstory and other, other angles of this, I've been doing this since I was three years old. So, you know, and there's a reason, and, you know, with intentionality, you know, I have this legacy visual arts story and you can go to my YouTube. Other people have interviewed me. Um, and you can hear other pieces of the story, like, well, how did that happen? And how did that happen? And how it's this article, though. And um, I don't want to go into all of how I got into New York City, but well, how I got, because the whole before I got into New York City is a whole nother dialogue of importance of, you know, how I've tackled being a visual artist, okay? Um, and 
uh, that's applied and fine art. I'm, I'm disciplined in both and proficient in both, humbly say I say so, which is, you know, kind of rare. So I think it's important that I pass this, you know, all of that I have, um, you know, along. And so the article um, is, was timely. I moved into New York City with, with my husband. Um, we, we came out of Washington, D.C. in the mid-Atlantic. Um, in essence, I followed him on a corporate move and I left my mom and home and everything and we moved to New York City. And um, some of the integral uh, details of how I broke into New York and all of that, that's another discussion. <laughs> but I want to stay focused on this article and you know maybe we can come back and talk about okay let's do a let's do a chat about how to break into new york city okay um so with that um with that said i came into new york um and one thing led to another and i found myself at pratt institute and what i did because i had been i had already had a decade of professional experience um, from Washington, D.C., Mid-Atlantic Market. I was a broadcast art director and very, very fortunate to have worked for three local networks and award-winning. I've always had a knack for winning lots of awards. <laughs> That's a whole nother interview in itself. I don't win an award, <laughs> okay? Um, and, um, I, you know, I'm humble about it because I think everything that has happened to me, it's not by accident. In other words, it's a blessing, but I put some intentionality into it. But back to the article. Um, so Pratt was generous enough to review my work and gave me 50% of my degree based on my portfolio experience of 10 years. And they told me, pay the tuition, um, take other kinds of classes, and that I finished that program in a, a three-year program in a year and a half. I, I'm a little driven. <laughs> and when I got down to the end, a. Tom Manassi at the time was chair of the, chair of the um, design department. And he said to me, Ms. Miller, he said something very, very simple. He says, we're not gonna let you just walk out of this school. This is, we're just not gonna let you walk out. So easy in is not easy out for you. You cannot do, you cannot do a design project for your thesis. And I kind of looked at him and I said, okay, so we can't do a design project to get through, finish. I'm down to the end, all the courses, tuition paid, everything that I needed to do in order to get to the thesis. Um, he says, we've decided you cannot do a design project. That is gonna be too easy. You're not skating through here. And Aton looked at me, I'll never forget it. His office was um, at Lincoln Center on Broadway. And, you know, he would see students and kind of tell us where we are and what we had to do. And I can still see him <laughs> in his studio loft. Miller, we want you. In other words, we've talked about you and we've talked about this. And he said, we want you in particular, okay? I don't know what he told anybody else. I can only tell you what he told me. He says, we want you to make a contribution to the industry. And so your, th your thesis, we're putting a demand and a command on you to make a contribution to your industry. And so I said, okay. And here we are. So it started with, I wanted to get out of school, Saria. I wanted to get, Sierra, I'm sorry. I wanted to get out of school. And so I said, okay, well, they're not gonna let me do a design project. And I had assessed a problem when I was in the Mid-Atlantic. It was a very, very simple project, but I saw distant, I mean, I saw a problem. And I saw this disenfranchisement between um, the lack of, connectedness in education to the design profession. So in the Mid-Atlantic, we weren't really near design schools. And in DC, there were really only three or four universities and American University, Howard University, Maryland University, some college, community colleges, Baltimore University. Um, but 
right around DC, there weren't any schools, the closest was MICA, um, where you could really just study graphic design. All those schools at the time had BFAs. You could walk out with a BFA, okay, um, fine art degree. And so you learned, back then you learned, you know, what it meant to be a fine artist. And then in that market, you would hit the trail trying to look for a job. And in a town that isn't really business, you know, all of that region is predominantly association work. A couple of corporations back then, all government and all government contract. So a fine artist really, unless you, unless you knew somebody or something, you weren't gonna get a job. So I kind of saw, and then that region, please wind me back and put me, drop me in a, you know, I'm, so that you'll understand, I'm so, squarely a baby boomer, <laughs> okay? And so that you can really kind of pinpoint where I was in this and where we are now. I started college touring out of Washington, D.C. As, as a teenager, the day Martin Luther King was assassinated, okay? Washington was burning. And my father said, we're still going to New England. And I applied to three schools, all right? I applied to RISD, Pratt, and um, Boston University, Boston Museum School. And he says, we're gonna let Washington burn. We're going, we're going to no New England. So that you can understand where this is, where this story fits in. And I, I, I get into New York with this and I'm working on my, I'm working on my graduate degree in communications design and I gotta write this, I, they're not gonna let me design. But I had seen this disenfranchisement of mid-Atlantic participants, um, and mostly then black and white. It wasn't as um, diverse a community as it is now. Okay, please just wind me back. This is civil rights. I, I was born post-civil rights. I grew up through the civil rights and I practiced post-civil rights. So pre-civil rights, civil rights, and post-civil rights. And one of the things that I'm, you know, on a last interview last week, you know, I won, I won an award recently for the Harlem Art Festival and they branded me, Cheryl Miller, the corporate communications design firm that defined the civil rights era. Well, I didn't know that. I didn't know that's what I was doing. <laughs> and we'll come back and talk about branding and, and, and how, how my work, you know, how I have legacy work. All right, um, and, and, and that's very important, especially during, you know, we're doing this in pandemic. And so I was doing this during the civil rights era. All right, and so, um, you know, once you drop me in this timeline, it, you know, don't, don't expect me to be able to really have an awful lot about what's going on here, but the story of how I did the impossible then still transcends doing the impossible now, okay? And this article, I was pushed and I have always had an academic, um, you, you know, I was, as a kid, you know, my father says, okay, it's great you want to do, be, be art, but have a backup plan. And I was always, you know, he did the best, my family did the best in terms of my academic education. I was always in a magnet school or something, you know, so I knew, I, I knew, I knew how to read and write. <laughs> and I knew how to do a thesis paper. So the first thing I did was I got, um, cross readers. I said, okay, so no art project. Let's analyze um, this disparity and this disenfranchisement that I see in the African American community, predominantly in the mid Atlantic. That's not, they're not at the time, at the time they're not, um, we're, we're not in an environment where designers are being trained. So fine artists are being trained and then they hit the streets and they wanna um, get jobs. I'm like back then that wasn't, that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> okay. And so with that, you know, I started coaching designers in 1974. You know, I was, a, I was one of the few folks in town that had a job, that could get a job. And mostly my peers who had jobs, we all had left um, to get specific degrees in, in, in graphic design. Um, and so with that, I knew, I knew a problem and an issue. So when it came time to write this contribution, I knew I had to have other voices other than just um, a design perspective. And um, I got, um, because I was at MICA, I, I had bonded with, that's a whole other story, how I got there <laughs> from Rhode Island School of Design, how I got there. Um, we won't, won't focus there, but I knew Le Dr. Leslie King Hammond. 
who you can Google her now. She's an acclaimed um, uh, African and African um, American historian, art historian, and she was um, um, she's emeritus with all kinds of things down at MICA. But at the time, um, I asked her if she would be my academic coach with this, and um, we she pushed me and I pushed myself, and I got all different kinds of cross readers and information. And I put together this thesis, okay? It was a piece of scholarship. And before I talk to the article, you know, this is, e even in my collection, the guidelines for writing it, okay? I donated all of the, the manuals. We were given manuals, um, paper. Uh, we had rules for writing this uh, to get out. So I'm like, it had to be on special paper. I was in New York City. I had to go, God knows, someplace down. And back then it had to be typed and then it had to be bound. I had all the notes for how to write the thesis are even in the collection, okay? And so, um, so with that, you know, let me just read a paragraph. All I'm gonna do is read a paragraph and then we'll go back to talking the article. Graphic, and, graphic, graphic design can be considered a select field to which only a few can afford its education and withstand the subsequent pressures of competitive opportunities in the marketplace. The graphic design industry is discerning, sc scrutinizing in its practices. Very few Blacks succeed as respected graphic designers. The industry is open to receive black, Blacks as new participants, but very few can meet the demands necessary to embrace the challenge and opportunity. Okay. Well, you can't just go off and say that, <laughs> okay? So, you know, I mean, you just can't go off and say that. And I got, um, I got a quote. So that's my first footnote in this thesis. I went off and interviewed uh, Ro Roz Goldfarb, President Jerry Fields Group to New York, New York, November 16th, 1984, okay? Roz, there were only three, there were only two or three headhunters in New York. Okay, and either you got a job on your own or you were placed. And Roz had a popular firm and I interviewed her. She gave me a note. First, first paragraph, first note. So the document was full of scholarship and notes. And even in the collection that's at Stanford, all of my interviews, the cassettes, people, you know, I went around New York and I went, you know, all of my notes for all this stuff you know, old cassettes and discs and handwritten royal typewriters. I saved everything, okay? So it's just not this article that's there. It's all, I mean, I looked at the cassette tapes, you know, um, and they have been, um, God bless them, they have been digitizing the cassette tapes of people that I interviewed in order to write the thesis, all of these articles. I just didn't wake up and say, had a hissy fit about what I was seeing. I went out and got the scholarship. And that's the part that, you know, let's talk about this article. And that's how, it, you know, the article is undergirded with a challenge. Make a contribution to your industry. You can't get out of Pratt unless you make this contribution. And I went about not being a designer. I went out being, I went out with this course task to be a design scholar and a historian. So, and I got one of the best academic coaches I can who pushed me to excellence to write a document that began with, you can graduate in 1985 from Pratt. Okay, so let's look at some things about where I was when this got published and what's going on. That This is some of the how. First off, I had an advocacy. I saw people suffering. And I had been in New York myself trying to I made a big mistake. If you're on LinkedIn, last week's interview, I made a big mistake coming into New York. Okay, it's a whole nother interview. Go to my LinkedIn and um, Leif interviewed me and, um, you know, I gave my faux pas. You want to know how to get into New York City? Don't do what I did. <laughs> but it eventually worked out, but it could have been a lot easier. Okay, but I had an advocacy. I knew the injustice. I knew it coming into it. And then um, I had um, my, my, my business, I had a purpose, okay? I had a purpose. Um, 
and I had a two part purpose, which made the studio very popular. Um, I came into New York City in 1982. I finished graduate, I, I, I finished Pratt in 85. I started the firm in 84. Whole nother, oh my God, how'd you start the firm? <laughs> okay. How to start a design firm is all. A New York City one at that, that's a whole nother interview. Um, but I had this two point mission. I had a business template and it started with any major Fortune 500 company on 6th Avenue would become my client. And I was charged with, I, you know, there were, there were four women of color, three or four women of color doing, I, I call it, we were media divas at the time. We, we didn't, call, we each had something different, all right? So Carolyn Jones was, Mingo Jones, she was um, advertising and, uh, Jewel McCabe was sales promotion and PR. Terry Williams was strictly PR. And I dared to say that I wanted C-suite. So you got to dare to say what you are. I wanted C-suite, um, corporate communications, high-end fancy books. Okay. That's what I wanted. Annual reports, fancy social responsibility books, you know, slick books, coffee table books that came out of corporations. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I did. Okay, and so I would secure, the doors would open, a whole nother interview, how that happened, that is really, really worth another hour. Okay, oh my God, how did I get that business? How did I get started? You know, um, how I broke into New York. But we're past all of that, and we're there, we're selling, and I'm doing this. And this is also timing. This is the 80s, where um, predominantly, predominantly, um, African American faces begin to be become integrated into ads. So McDonald's and all the corporate, they're beginning to change corporate iconography. And I was the lady in charge. Okay. I was, the, I was the lady that could do it. So Miller, put some black folks in, <laughs> put some black folks in our, in our literature. And I'm like, I got it. I can do that. <laughs> and so, and then I delivered. So in delivering those fancy books and breaking up the visual statement, okay, then I was sent as an in-kind service. So one client made two. All right. And so this was a place where corporations, um, and corporations still do, um, pick and choose where they're going to sponsor. And I had a mission in that. I was sent as an in-kind service. So for an example, Time Inc. was a very large client for me, a prominent client. And I'd helped to put people of color into their literature. And then they sent me over to um, United Negro College Fund. Okay. And in doing that and paying for me to go over there, they were like, go and enhance their corporate communication. So my mission was corporations and organizations after the civil rights movement needed to be presented and they needed to present themselves in a way in order to attract you know to attract sponsorships and grants and funding and they could like my they could not look like the church bulletin <laughs> okay and i was the only one around new york saying i can dress you up for this okay i can dress you up for this so one client me too all right, so a corporation would pay for me to put people of color in, and then they would pay for me to go across town someplace else to our African-American organization, national organization, and make them look worthy, dressed up for the occasion, so that they could present and get sponsors and donors. And so I had this mission that I, when I look back, I did, okay, the firm did. Um, the, the corporate communications that define post-civil rights era organizations and I was documenting history and the poster house, God bless, they have five of my corporate posters and the one that comes with a story all by itself is NASA's commission for Dr. Mae Jameson. They called me up and said, we need a poster for Mae Jameson. She's the first African-American astronaut, fem female astronaut, can you get us 
can you get us a poster at the launch site? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so it was this portfolio full of, I'm documenting. All right, so this was the mission. So but back to the article. So I believed in all of this. I had an advocacy, your article, and who you are. I had an advocacy, I had a purpose, and I had a mission. So all of that came together with finishing this thesis, and I believed in this thing so much, okay, that I went and knocked on, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I took the thesis, I put it in a, a brown, uh, manila envelope with a yellow sticky it wasn't even anything fancy print ma i looked in the front of print magazine there were only two magazines and there were only two organizations that were anything of anything okay and i think it's probably almost about the same okay it was communications art and print magazine okay if you were anybody to anybody to anything you would you either won one of those art director, you know, awards, or you were published, or God knows if you're a writer in any one of those. Okay, and then the, there was the Art Directors Club, which is now the One Club, and AIGA. Okay, and then there was the American Institute, um, um, PG Printers, a big, a big fancy print. They're all this elite. There was a, an elite printers award. Um, the Art Directors Club had an award, AIG had an award, that, that was it. You had to collect your awards there, you had to be featured and talked about in only two magazines, and God knows if you were a writer. So I said, well, I'm gonna do what all good successful designers do. I'm gonna take this thesis and I'm gonna march it right over. <laughs> March it right over to Martin Fox. I sent enough to open my print magazines. Oh, I forgot. And there was a type, there was a type, there was a type, um, uh, oh God, and I had a bunch of those, all the original type letters, letter form. Oh God, you had to be a part of the type club. Listen, I did the real thing. <laughs> okay. And so, but back to this. So I took the, I took the thesis, put it in an envelope with a yellow sticky, and I walked it over, and I got Mr. Mr. Fox's name on the inside of one of my print magazines, and I said, Mr. Fox, I want to make this article. No, I made my thesis. Here comes my contribution. Here it comes. Here it comes. I want to make this a feature magazine article. By the time I walked from print magazine back to my little studio, okay, I got in, I sat down. I hadn't sat down 10 minutes, and the phone rang. It was Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox. He said, Ms. Miller, we want to, we want to, we, we want to give you um, a contract. We want to give you a check and we want to give you an editor. And we want you to write your thesis. And we're going to feature it. We're going to feature it. So Cheryl, this is a really good time for us to also talk about. So you got there, you have it. They're like, we're going to publish it. Let's flash forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, but before we go, I want, I want people to know the how. It was three things in place. Advocacy, mm -hmm. purpose, and mission. Absolutely. Okay, now what happened is what the editor told me. Okay? They, they, they rejected the first draft. And Tom Goss was my editor. And he said to me, when we started, he said, Mrs. Miller, you may never, ever, ever be a famous designer because your work is good. He looked at me, he says, you will be known by this advocacy. Don't spend any money on advertising. Be about something and stay with that. That's how you're going. To, in other words, everybody wants to be famous in New York. He said, everybody in New York can design. That's nothing. If you're not a good designer in New York, you're back on the train, Amtrak, Trailways, Greyhound, American Airlines shuttle. You're out of there. He said to me, your advocacy and what you believe is what's going to give you notoriety. And he said to me, he gave me, okay, he gave me the Oprah factor before Oprah even knew that she had a factor. Listen, put me in perspective. My first job, I worked with Gail King 
at WTOP Channel 9, Washington, D.C. I was a junior art director, graphic designer type, and she was she worked as a production assistant. Okay, this is how long we've been at this. <laughs> okay, wind me back. And he said to me, he taught me the Oprah factor. And I want this is the place where I want, I want to, I want to show. I'm gonna read a bit, bit of the article. This article, Trey Seals wrote me, and he said, Mrs. Miller, when I just got your magazine on an eBay auction. I paid 60 bucks. I'm like, 60 bucks for, for this magazine? <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. And listen, I gotta give you a footnote why this is so important. They gave me, I don't know, uh, it's 10 pages, four and a half, six spreads, okay? The first draft got kicked back. Sarah, this is what's important. Tom gave me the Oprah factor. He said to me, Miss Miller, this article is not about you. And here's the Oprah factor. He said, go find black designers who are not missing. That's what we want to see in this article. And weave your thesis, go find the footnotes, go find the business voices, and you are not the story, Missy. You are not the diva. Go find the designers that everybody thinks are missing. And the lights went on, and that's the Oprah factor. Oprah, when she does an interview and stuff, it's not about her. She's, lift, she's raising up and lifting up everybody else, and then all of a sudden, if Oprah says it, it is so. <laughs> he was right. He said, it's not about you. Go find the missing and present them. And so you can find it, it's online, and it is absolutely a beautiful article. They gave me so many pages, and I featured my peers and my friends, and I want to, I want to add a history note, okay? I got to add a history note, and I asked Sierra if I could do this. Don't, don't worry, I reminded myself. <laughs> I, I reminded myself, this is so important. This one is so important. I was honored. I was honored to see my colleague then, Douglas Davis, just from um, a documentary was done on Tony Despina. Now, I know Tony. And when I got to New York, Tony, he was the letterman, OK? He was the letterman. And you got to see the documentary. And he was exquisite. And the documentary is beautiful. You must know Tony Despina. But it was my job, let me see if I can find it. It was my job to tell you then and to tell you now, Kirk Brown. <laughs> Kirk Brown. Kirk Brown was our Tony Despina. And I wasn't going to let, I wasn't going to let, um, I wasn't going to let the design community miss Kirk Brown. Kirk Brown was, I, you know, he was there too. And he's best known, let's see if we can see this one, right here. This was his claim to fame back then. Okay, Kurt has, had a table in my studio. I don't remember the relationship, but I said, Kurt, come. Come to the studio, grab a table, sit there, <laughs> okay? And he did beautiful letters. And his claim to fame is the Mets 25th anniversary logo. It was my job to tell you that, yeah, Tony was there. I love Tony, his work is gorgeous. But it was my job to tell you that Kirk Brown was the other guy too. It was my job. When Douglas posted, everybody's a, such a wonderful documentary on Tony. I'm like, Kirk was there too. And you should see his lettering. So, so I also so, wanna- so my, 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 my point here is that Tom Goss said, Cheryl, show us the black community. Show us the designers. And so we published this and it's still here. I was third, you know, so we're looking at this. I had first rights, 
if I had the Oprah factor before Oprah knew she had a factor. In other words, it's not about you. Your job is to tell us if they're missing and you say they're not missing, then show us who they are. So then I had an empathy, okay? I saw uh, the disenfranchisement. I saw the injustice. And because I had made such an idiotic, <laughs> I wasn't always perfect with my last LinkedIn. I wasn't always perfect. That was my, 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 my arrogance for coming into New York. I learned what it was like to be on the streets in New York. And my ignorance was I had a, I had a wonderful opportunity to come right into ABC television. And I said, no, okay, go find that. It's on LinkedIn. Go I don't want to spend time with that. But it put me on the street learning what it was like to break into New York with nothing. Okay. And so with that, I had this empathy for those who maybe weren't even this remotely trained and exposed. Okay. I, I knew what they were feeling. Because I, I remember when I tell you I groveled on the streets of New York City, I did, okay? And how I got out of that is a whole nother, <laughs> whole nother interview. But I had a passion for this injustice. And I had this courage. And my fight now, I had, there was an equality. So people always ask me, well, what was it this time? Like, well, no, it was equal, but there was no equity. Okay, so I could get in, I could get the interviews, I could get portfolio reviews. You know, and but there was no equity. Equity means okay, well, equal I can get in, but equity is somebody gonna give me a job? No, because <laughs> they're all, you know, they're all small businesses, and you know, that's another conversation. I'm back on the article. It was about showing the advocacy, the purpose, the mission, the empathy, and it was about me showing the community that there were designers. There were only a few of us. There were only a few of us. And it was my job not to talk about me, how wonderful I was. <laughs> it was for me to tell, these are my friends and they're more wonderful than I am. And I'm going to write and tell you. And just like I, I'm really passionate about this, you should know Kirk. You should know Kirk Brown. You should know, he, he was, we're Tony, the Spanish peers. We were there together. Okay, and Kirk, you can go to his website. You can find him on LinkedIn. His work is gorgeous. And then, you know, and I will be the one to tell you that, you know, I'm the one to tell you. I'm, I'm a historian at this point. <laughs> okay, so now the next article. Oh, let's read a little bit. So I read a little bit of the thesis. Let's 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 just read just a touch of this. Okay. And, yep. and Cheryl, I want to let you know that you have about ten more minutes to also share about your second article as well. Oh yeah. Okay. So uh, let's go. Graphic design can be considered a select professional field, which only a few may enter. Owing it to its costly education preparation and subsequent competition in the marketplace. The graphic design industry, which includes clients as well as practitioners, is highly selective in choosing its participants and, it, and as a result, very few, few Blacks succeed as influential or even visible graphic designers. Indeed, there are few Black graphic designers practicing in the field, in the profession at all. This is 1987, it's published, I finished school in 1985, and my Oprah factor was I had to go and show, I have Danita and I have Carol Porter, who is recognized um, uh, newspaper um, journalist, uh, designer with the Washington Post. My friend um, at the time, Michelle <clears throat> Cobb, was art director for Sports Illustrated. Eli Kentz, you know, he was with one of the highbrow pentagram, one of them, okay. It was my job to show the community that we, we existed. And then what took flight was these beautiful AIGA recognitions in my initial work in. So, and I'm on the website, they give me credit. It, and it all starts with, with Cheryl Miller didn't know her article was gonna do this. I didn't. <laughs> I, just, I just knew how to write a thesis. And, be and believe that it should be published and that the community needed to meet my friends. So with that said, 2016, print digs me up again. I don't have a Wikipedia. <laughs> so they call, they call me and graciously said, Ms. Miller, can we have a, um, can we have a quote from you for Black History? 
I, and I say this all the time, I had to laugh. I bowed my head. I was right here in this office when the phone rang. I don't know how they found me. <laughs> okay. Or maybe from the website and I called or whatever, because I don't have a Wikipedia. All right. And I said, I am so honored that you want a quote from me. I said, my quote is easy. The more things change, the more they say the same. Cheryl Miller. I said, why would you want a quote from me? I did challenge them very nicely. I said, why would you want a quote from me? Why would you dig me up? One of the most poignant articles that has had an eternal shelf life <laughs> that has ever been published in print magazine, and you call me for a quote. So you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe that you have what I call the it factor. You're the only one with this. Everybody is special. Everybody is important. Everybody has a voice. You got to dig deep and find it. That's what the quarantine is about. Take some quiet time and find out what is your eternal gift that has been given to you and that your gift back to God is what you do with it. And I've always known that. So when they called and said, you want a quote? I said, no, I'm not going to give you a quote because the quote's easy. The more things change, the more they stay the same. I said, and then I challenged. I challenged the editor. God bless her. She must have said, oh my God, this woman, is she's, she's angry. <laughs> I'm not aggressive. I'm assertive. I said, I, I knew what I had. I had a, this 1987 article that was eternal. This is 2016. And now you want something from me? I said, don't you, don't you want another article? I said, if I wrote you one that is now auctioned on eBay, and it's changed everybody's life. Why would you call me for one, one quote? Send me off to do it again. So the second one will last. So they came back the same way. <laughs> this time, the, this time I knew how to write one. It didn't get kicked back. I used my Oprah factor and then some. So I went back and I found everybody. I found some new voices. I interviewed and saw the 2016, okay? And the more things change, I used my favorite quote that's in my thesis. Um, they were beautiful, they worked with me, gave me a contract, gave me a check, gave me a deadline, and the editor didn't kick it back. We tweaked it, added, beautiful. I wanna shout out, thank you for the second one. And I leave it off with, um, when in doubt, I offer my favorite quote. I offered it in 1987, and, it remain, and it's in my thesis, and it may, remains my personal mantra for transcending obstacles to success. I have learned that success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he or she has overcome while trying to succeed. Looked at this from this standpoint, I almost reached the conclusion that often the Negro boys and girls birth and connection with an unpopular race is an advantage so far as real life is concerned. With few exceptions, the Negro youth must work harder and must perform his or her task even better than a white youth in order to secure recognition. But out of the hard and unusual struggle through which he or she is compelled to pass, he gets a strength, a confidence that one misses whose pathway is comparatively smooth by reason of birth and race. Up from slavery, Booker T. Washington. The second one. All from the first one all from the thesis and the demand, make a contribution, Miller, to your industry. So to recap, and cause you're gonna zoom me off in a minute. <laughs> I had advocacy. Never zoom you off. <laughs> I had advocacy, advocacy, purpose, mission, I was empathetic. In other words, I, I felt it. I experienced it. I was privileged enough that coaching designers for 70, since 1974, I, people couldn't pay their rent. People had 
marriages on the rock, frustration, depression. I saw all kinds of um, scenarios that broke my heart about people of color trying to be in this industry and not prepared. And here I was prepared and I was still feeling some of this. So I felt it. And I believed in the scholarship. I just didn't have a hissy fit, Sierra. <laughs> I believed in the scholarship of the thesis that led to the door opening up for it to be published. And then the rest took its life and here we are. So it's the how. I mean, I can come back and talk about the why, but these components, okay, if, if the next generation will lean into their advocacy mm -hmm. and write and dare to knock on the doors. Um, and one of the things that I even challenged some of my, you know, I talk to everybody. If you find me, I'll talk to you. I, got, I told you, leave me alone with these. I can have karaoke night and give you war stories. I gave you one with Kirk, okay? Oh, no. <laughs> um, uh, and and um, all, all to say that I speak to so many. I stop for everybody because I didn't have anybody. I didn't have any mentor. Nobody, not a soul. Not a soul helped me with design. I had I had one. I had one person to help me with business, and thank God I was I'm married to. And you know, a corporate guy, a business guy, and I have a I've had a knack for selling Cheryl Miller design. But I've been brave, and I believed I had something to offer, and and here we are, and it's all because of this article. Thank and that's you. The, that's the story of the article. You did that. Um, I want to thank you, Cheryl, for sharing your story it's been amazing to just like hear you talk about this process from start from the first article from before the first article how it came to be to now um the second article which came out of you just boldly saying i don't want to give you just a quote i want to revisit this topic and bring some new life into it and I also want to point out that you will be talking soon at the hue design summit um about other aspects of your work and a little bit about this as well um so for the folks who are going to the hue design summit you can also find cheryl there now, um oh, yeah. what, I'd, what i'd like to annotate into that do it what, what i'm <laughs> going to be doing is surveying the collection okay so what's in this collection and i'm going to talk about really um how I put this career together since I was three. And we're going to, you know, I'm talking about the story of the Cheryl Miller collection at Stanford University. And um, I'm going to um, reveal what's in the collection, talk about the collection, and how I journey from the time I was a kid. So this just didn't happen. So that's really the difference in that conversation is that we're going to do a survey of the collection. Uh, so that you can see, um, I, I'll show you some pointers into it, but there's a depth to the collection that's beyond the portfolio of the collection. So we're going to be talking about the story yet again. I think it's so important that everyone understands, you know, how I want you to have a collection. Yeah, I yeah. think that um, we've seen the we've seen a lot of organizations come out of this conversation that you started. I, I think that there is more space and room now for um, black people and other people of color to come together with peers, find mentors, and kind of really set themselves up for their voice to be heard in a way that you had to fight for yours to be in the case of this article, in the case of the second article, and for those who who still are to come to learn from your article and whatnot. Um, so I also want to shout out the folks at, um, at hashtag Black Creatives. I want to shout out, of course, to Design Summit. I want to shout out the um, African American graphic designers and all of these great organizations who are doing the work to, that's really 
around supporting the next generation of, of black graphic designers and getting their voices um, heard to the extent that yours are so that others can have their legacy piece. Um, very similar to your piece that you just discussed, which I, I'm so grateful that you've shared with us and our folks here. And for those of you who have not been to Poster House yet, when we are reopened, uh, please come to Poster House and you can see one of Cheryl's pieces in our uh, poster wall. And we hope to actually have more access to Cheryl's pieces in the near future. Um, Cheryl, is there any advice you wanna give anyone who is looking for a chance to share their voice? Yeah. Um, um, before I do that, is there go any ahead. question? Go I ahead. haven't gotten any questions, so I think that okay. you could just go right ahead. You're oh. that thorough. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay. Um, yeah, usually folks are kind of like shocked. <laughs> <laughs> or, like she said or, everything. <laughs> yeah, or, or um, uh, Please, I'll answer any question, and every question is valid, okay? And you can, and, and usually the answer is yes. Okay, I, I get a question and like, well, will you talk to me? Will you do the, can, you can speak to us? Like, yes, 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 and yes. I've been doing this since 1974. Find me on LinkedIn now, <laughs> okay? Um, I, what I want people to do, this is really simple, um, which goes into another lecture about um, the business. Um, and, and how I was able to um, foster business and create this. I mean, we had a firm. Oh my God. <laughs> if you read the last pages of the 2016 magazine, I tell the community what to do. Um, and what it is, is whether, whether, whether um, American business accepts it or not, um, voices of color must design solutions, must design solutions for global corporate market places. And you have to know that because it's just not the dominant culture anymore. And the dominant culture doesn't know all of how to communicate globally now and but you're the one that has to say you're the solution I would say if I was practicing I'd have one of the largest the best diversity design firms in New York City okay and why is that I miss you <laughs> yeah, no 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 you don't miss me right now <laughs> I don't mind being a consultant for somebody and I can zoom in okay I don't mind that and you hit up me on my PayPal, Zelle, Venmo, I got it all, okay? <laughs> but I'm not going into New York right now, okay? Oh, of course not. No, of course not. Uh, um, but I'll give you an example. All right, and it breaks my heart. And if you follow me on LinkedIn, I got a hashtag, fire the art director. Uh, hire designers, hashtag hire designers, diverse designers. Every time I see a corporation, okay, roll out something and then black Twitter takes it down. The rollout goes on Friday and black Twitter by Saturday has taken you down because you didn't know what to do. And then I want to, I need some statistics. See, that's the thing I'm not willing to do that I'm inspiring somebody under the sound of my voice to do. Go look at those faux pas and how did that faux pas rolling out a major sneaker up, rolling out a major this, that, and the other. And then black Twitter takes you down on Saturday. How did that affect the stock market on Monday morning? That's what you have. Not the hissy fit. Okay. You got to have the facts to be able to go in to say to the gap, to H and M, uh, you know, the newspapers who want to mix up Patti LaBelle with Aretha Franklin and Aretha Franklin's not even buried yet. These corporate faux pas go on and on and on and black Twitter takes you down. Okay. And you are the solution. If you are media, if you are corporate communications, if you are producing whatever it is, you can go into a major corporations. If you've got the, if you've got the savvy, <laughs> to go knock on the door. Did you know, I would do crazy stuff like that. I would go say, you know, black Twitter took you down. 
What happened? You roll that sneaker out, Nike or whoever, I won't call out. I don't know. You see it all the time. Okay. I'm like, oh my God, how much did you spend on that? And I, you, you can't walk in and say, well, this is not fair. This doesn't look good for our community and black took it, took, took it down. No, you got to be able to write a proposal. You got to be able to knock on the right door. You got to be able to say that faux pas made this mistake, cost you this on the stock market. Okay. And you need me to tell you how not to do that again. Then you have a piece of work that's prime sourced and you can write the invoice and run a studio. I'm inspiring folks to go do that. But what I'm sharing with you, the article, my business, everything, it was based on scholarship. And if I was going to walk into any one of these corporations and said, you know what, Friday you spent all that money on that sneaker, on that sweater, on that jumpsuit, on this, that, and the other, and Black Twitter took you down because you missed it. I better be able on Monday morning to walk in and say, this is what you need to do. And this is how it affects your bottom line. So I'm inspiring, you know, the next practitioner to be business savvy and to take a leap of faith and see the need and be the solution at, by any means necessary. Absolutely. And Cheryl, we have one question and then we will wrap this up. Okay, thank you. Please share your reaction. Well, please share the reactions and industry response to your original missing in action piece and what kind of conversations were being had following. So we know that in the AIGA article that they talk about the conference and there is a, um, they also had a group after that was formed to, in response to your article, but what else happened? Well, I think it took its, I think it, it took its course, N nothing negative. It took its course. There have been great voices after me, okay? And um, they're all historical notes as well. So, you know, there's another discussion, women in design. Listen, guys, I did all of this and, you know, I told you I had a corporate husband and he's looking, he was looking for babies. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole nother, you know, and then once, you know, once I realized time was up and my kid was, you know, two years old, I said, you know what? I did what Pratt wanted me to do. I made my contribution. But I got them to college and my work started coming back for me. And the first place, it was the article. You know, can you write again? Stanford, can we have your collection? It, my legacy work called me back. It allowed me pause to raise a family. And then it came back, like Miller, you're not finished. And my job is to inspire you to finish. You know, this article is second and third generation notations and scholarship, cross disciplines, all kinds of things. I want you guys to do better than me. And I want, if there's anything while in my living, see a eulogy, when you're dead, they read your eulogy and you're supposed to sit and listen to what this person did so that you don't have to do it. That's what a real eulogy is. I don't want you to come to my funeral. I'm here all of these accomplishments and stuff on the back of the obituary bulletin. And then I teach you something there and that you don't have to experience. Listen, listen and glean and be inspired now. Okay. To finish this, be the solution and use this time. Even in the pandemic, I interviewed with someone else. Lean into this. I say, this is a, this is a gold rush, make shovels. And there's so much to do in this pandemic and save everything. You're documenting history. You're documenting history if you're, if you're practicing and finding ways um, to, to publish um, manuals and advocacy. And, you know, I'm making masks, okay? I'm, listen, my, my archive is open, which means that my kids know my work is there. And whatever I leave here, when I go to glory, they'll send an ad, add to it, all these interviews and things. You know, this is in this... This story of mine is important and you guys have to make your own stories to keep this. You got to finish this and be inspired. Okay. And you just, I, that, that's it. That, that's it. So the answer to the question is it was received and <laughs> others have come behind me. I was not the only one, but I was like, look, I got a shout out to Dorothy Hayes. She wrote before me. Okay. In 1969, I think it was, um, they published, 
print published. But all those things were like priming the well. Like down south, you're priming the well, priming the well, priming the well. And then finally somebody comes and taps it and the water comes out. You know, I'm not a gambling woman, but you know, can you imagine a slot machine? You're putting in quarters, 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 quarters. You walk away and then somebody comes in, puts in a quarter, pulls the lever and the whole thing. But you know, it was just timing. Just absolutely timing. And God knew that out of my community, I'd have the biggest mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and I would get to New York and shout from the rooftop, we're here, we're here. And I'm still shouting, we're here, we're here, and now you all are here with me, you know? And I, you know, my answer is yes. You'll write me and ask me and I'll say yes. Most things, I, I never, when it comes to this, I never say no. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for your time and for sharing your expertise and all that you have to share with us, even though there are still so many stories to uncover with you. Okay. Um, Thank you all who, who attended. Thank you those who stayed with us a little late so that Cheryl could share a little bit of extra wisdom with us. And we hope to see you all again at other Poster House events. And we hope to hear more from Cheryl. Well, I mean, I imagine we will anyway, but. <laughs> okay, and you can find me on LinkedIn. Absolutely. The, the answer is yes. Okay, will I connect? Yes. Will I talk to you? Yes, you know. Please connect to her on, yes. on LinkedIn. She's a great connection to have. Right, and the only thing I won't do is come to New York right now, okay? But we can <laughs> You can zoom her in, but she won't come to New York. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you, Poster House. And um, we were blessed. Um, you guys did a great job of moderating. We didn't get bombed. And I love you guys. Please be safe. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm following, I'm, you know, I'm still outside of New York. I'm following Gov Governor Cuomo. Whatever he's doing, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and so that's, that's my, that's my, that's my advice. And I, I have another one that you'll see me on Facebook with. When the hospitals can let me visit, um, that's when I'm coming out. Until then, I'm safe and sound. I love you guys. Okay. Love you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Be the Good difference. night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.